Hi, everybody. Anyone in the room, we're going to have a really interesting talk if you want to stick around and listen, and there are refreshments back here. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Cowell. I'm the university librarian here at UC Santa Cruz, and I want to introduce Jacob Martinez to all of you. Uh, Jacob graduated from Oaks College with a degree in ecology and evolution in 2005, and he's been busy <laughs> ever since graduating. He's the founder of a nonprofit called Digital Nest. His idea for Nest began, began one night, which I just learned, when he saw a student sitting outside a closed building at Cabrillo Extension using the Wi-Fi and not being able to access the services because the, the building was closed. So he said it was all too common to see young people huddling outside buildings using Wi-Fi in Watsonville trying to complete schoolwork, apply for jobs, and access the social and networking opportunities enjoyed by their connected peers. So Jacob started Digital Nest to address this need. Jacob was a transfer student at UCSC. His organization has been successful, according to Jacob, in part because of the networking he started while an undergrad here. So he's going to talk a little bit about how he pursued his career after graduating. And just for your information, his work is now being recognized both locally and nationally, including speaking at the first White House tech meetup in 2015 and was named by TechCrunch as one of 2014's top men in the country supporting women in tech. So welcome, Jacob. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, we've got a nice little intimate uh, conversation for tonight. So thank you all for coming out. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'll grab a seat. Um, so. Uh, I was asked to come and kind of share my story and share kind of my career path. Um, and at any time, please just like, if you want to just jump in with a question or uh, we could also just, you know, don't feel like you need to wait to the end. We could just raise your hand and we'll jump right in. Um, so, uh, to, so you heard a lot about the, the, my accomplishments um, and a lot of that was due to lots of other people too. So I want to recognize all the other help I had kind of not in the room with me tonight. It's not just one person. It doesn't take just one person to do uh, all this that I've done. So I've had a lot of help along the way. Um, and a lot of it was uh, the beginnings of it really were, it was my time here at UCSC. Where like, it was like the beginning of, the, of my, I would say, professional career really happened here while I was a student. Um, but I'm going to go back a little further back to actually when I was in high school. Um, because that's when I, I really feel this, this uh, sp space in me to really drive social movements and the social justice piece really kind of emerged. Um, and how that came to be was actually, I, was, I grew up in majority of my time in Los Angeles. Um, I did spend a few years in Mexico City, uh, but mostly uh, LA. And at my freshman, right before my freshman year of high school, um, and mind you, I'm a, a complete LA boy. So if you think of people who grew up in LA, like I was an LA boy. Um, so my, right before I was about to go my freshman year of high school, um, my parents told me we were going on vacation. And I was like, where are we going? I was all excited, right? Just graduated, graduated from eighth grade, about to go on vacation. And I said, where are we going? And they said, we're going to Texas. And I was like, what? Who, who vacations in the summer in Texas? Um, but we went, and then I found out we were actually we were going there house hunting because we were actually moving there. Um, so at the age of 13, uh, 14, uh, my parents scooped up this L.A. boy and moved him to Dallas, Fort Worth in, in Texas. Um, so that was not an easy transition for me. Um, and uh, so I went to uh, school in Texas, uh, and uh, I moved to a community called South Lake. So if, you, if, you were, if we were in Texas right now, if we told people that I went to school in South Lake, no matter where you were in the state, people would know this community. Um, this is a really uh, wealthy community. Um, but here was this LA boy, my dad, because uh, he was bilingual and um, had an, it was an accountant, the company moved him out there. Um, and my dad, we, we owned a home in Los Angeles, but the value for our home in LA meant we could move into this community in South Lake. So my parents had no idea where they were moving me into. Um, but the community ended up being, um, of my 300 students who graduated high school, there was eight Latinos, there was one Filipino, and that was it. Um, so it was a predominantly white community. 
But what I experienced there, coming from LA, where most of my classmates were Filipinos or Mexicans, basically, um, moving to this really affluent community, I saw, what, I saw what opportunity and what wealth does for young people. I saw, went to school with a lot of people with really high confidence and with a lot of resources for all the SAT prep. And I mean, our, our high school, our, our, our hallways were carpeted, right? And this is like, who, like, that was just, just the amount of money that was in this community was just astonishing to me. And you see all these young people and all of them heading off to really great schools. Um, but I struggled. I struggled um, because of the color of my skin and not fitting in. Um, but then also, I think I was just rebelling because I was pissed that my parents moved me to Dallas. You know, so um, I barely graduated high school. Um, I did get a, an offer to to go play soccer in college, though. And so I went to a small school in East Texas in a town called Nagadocious. So even that much crazier than Dallas-Fort Worth. But I went to a school called Stephen F. Austin, uh, played soccer. Um, I actually got kicked out after my freshman year of, of college uh, for academic reasons. Um, and so at that point, I was 19 years old, and I said, I'm done. I need to get out of here. I can't live here anymore. Um, at the age of 19, I packed up my bags, and I took off to where all kind of runaways take off to, and that was San Francisco. Um, so I was able to go all the way to San Francisco. I had a cousin, so I was couch surfing. Who, he was at San Francisco State, um, so I was couch surfing a bit. Um, but then for once in my, the first time in my life, uh, I, I was in a space that I chose to be in and um, decided at that point to really kind of get into school. Um, so I went to the City College of San Francisco. Um, I was probably every single major you can think of. So, um, oh, one quick interesting fact about uh, City College. Um, when I transferred, they asked me if I ever went to school before, and I told them no, um, because I didn't want the grades to carry with me from Stephen F. Austin. So even UCSC doesn't know, technically, that I went to college a year. Now they do, yeah. Um, but it's a funny, it's kind of a funny running joke that I tell people just because I, I, back then there was no technology, so there was, it was like untraceable. Right? Nowadays, I don't think students can get away with it. In fact, you see what's going on in the news. They can't get away with it, right? Um, so I went to City College and kind of decided to really restart my life over. I was every single major you can think of, from, from Chicano studies to sociology. Um, but the summer before, actually, I, I, I transferred to UCSC, uh, or the, the, fall, the spring before I transferred to UCSC, um, I had to take a science requirement. Um, and so I took the, an environmental studies course, and I was hiking around the Bay Area in San Francisco in the beautiful spring, doing water samples and counting birds. And I'm like, this is great, the sciences. I want to go to the sciences. I love being outside. This is wonderful. Um, so right before I transferred, I switched my major from, uh, from Chicano studies and history to, to biology. Because my, my vision of what biology was, was hiking around the Bay Area, collecting water samples. And, um, but I came here, um, and uh, I transferred. Um, I commuted for a long time, because I had a, a, a girlfriend, who is now my wife, that was in San Francisco. So I was making the commute um, here to UCSC, and taking all these courses that I didn't realize I needed to take as a science major, and that was calculus, chemistry, ochem, physics, all, this, uh, all these courses I didn't want to take. Um, that wasn't in my mind what biology was, but I had to take them as prereqs. But at this point in my life, I've just been in school way too long. Um, so I was a transfer student. I was now entering my fifth year of college and barely starting up here. Um, I had three more years to go. Um, so it took me a long time to kind of get through all this. Um, but, what, uh, but while I was here, um, one of the things I did, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but um, there, was a, there used to be a, a trailer in the back of this, of the old, uh, whatever, build the science to whatever it was. Um, there was a trailer back there. And the rumor was there was a guy in there with a bunch of snakes. And um, I was really, I was started like getting into herpetology and studying reptiles and stuff. So I went knocking one day on this trailer because I was an undergrad and people told me you needed to do like 
internships or, you know, you know. So I ended up knocking on this guy's door and he's like, he opens the door and sure enough, there was a trailer full of uh, California mountain king snakes. He was doing research, he was a graduate student. And, he, and I told him, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really into, I'm a biology manager now. I just started up here at UCSC. I'm kind of into reptiles. I don't know, I always grew up with reptiles and I was kind of into it. I was like, do you need help? You know, and I just, I heard you're supposed to do internships and take advantage of being on the campus. And uh, he's like, so, and he, first thing he said was like, absolutely, anybody who's into reptiles, we will want them. So I started working with him. And then he took me to meet Barry Sinervo, who was a professor here uh, in ecology. And uh, he introduced me to Barry. And he's like, Barry, I got some guys into reptiles. There's not many of us here. Like, can we find him a place in the lab? Um, but I mentioned that because that, I, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was networking and kind of, kind of uh, uh, for the first time, really like knocking on a door and not realizing that that skill of like putting myself out there and knocking on the door and um, offering to help and asking for help was going to be really instrumental in my career, uh, even to this day. To the point, like people often ask me, like, why have you been? Why have I been so successful? And it's really my ability, I think, to network and build a build a community. Um, and all that started here by that first knock on the door. I really decided to stick my neck out there and um, and ask for help, and and also offer to help. Um, so when I was up at the, I got into the lab as an undergrad just to help out clean cages and stuff. Um, and then there was a graduate student there that told me about a program called CAMP. I think it's still around. And it was California Alliance for Minority Participation. So it was a program to help me get uh, scholarships um, to, to work in a lab, but earn some money. Um, they didn't pay for my time to work, you know, give me a little bit of money. Um, so I did that and um, I ended up getting a position in the lab. And Barry, at that point, um, had a bunch of undergrads and graduate students working with him. A lot of them were younger than me. Um, and so, and for my entire life, I've worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. Um, and he saw something in me uh, and my ability to kind of manage people uh, that, as an undergrad, he asked me if I'd be interested in managing the lab and managing all the grad students. And then Barry has a reputation here being really inaccessible and really challenging to work with. And, and, but him and I really hit it off. And um, it's funny, a lot of the grad students used to get mad at me because, or get frustrated because I had access to Barry and they were trying to, them as grad students couldn't get enough time with him, you know, but I kind of had access to Barry whenever I needed help with him, um, needed help or needed anything done. Um, so I was managing the lab, uh, working with a lot of grad students, working with a lot of uh, undergrads. A lot of undergrads would come to me. They heard I would be in my classes, and they heard I was in this position with Barry. And a lot of them would ask me if I could get them into the lab with Barry. Um, and so I'd end up like really help. I started helping a lot of young people uh, and trying to like introduce them to Barry. And trying, I got a few of them in. Uh, one of them, who is now the head herpetologist at the Academy of Sciences in uh, in San Francisco. Uh, she manages all the, the alligators and stuff, and she was an undergrad that came, approached me one day and asked me to get her in the lab, um, so I was able to help her out. Um, but so for the next three years that I was at UCSC, I worked in that lab, took classes, did okay, um, but really what I was putting all my time was in, into was this relationship with Barry and, and trying to build my skills of networking and build my, build my network. Um, uh, so I did that for three years uh, successfully, uh, at this point now, my, my girlfriend might be turned into my fiance, and she moved down here with me. Um, she was working for the Santa Cruz Sentinel as a writer, because she graduated from San Francisco State. Um, and we were on the verge of uh, getting married, and I was working in a lab, making no money, um, just graduated. Um, I got into some PhD programs, but at this point I was like, I need to get, I need to make some money to help pay for this wedding. Um, and so I went uh, to that woman from the CAMP program. That was the program I got into uh, that gave me some scholarships here. And I was like, Marlene, I think Marlene's still here, Marlene Robinson. I was like, Marlene, I'm about to get married. I need a job. Like, do you know of anybody who's looking for some help? And she's like, oh, absolutely. She's like, there's actually somebody looking for an admin. And there was another program in the sciences. Um, it was called the Mark and MBRS program. Um, now the director of it, I think, is Juliana Ortega. Um, so I, uh, 
she was, so that's the program that, um, she was actually one of my students. Uh, but so I started working as an admin at the front desk. And what that meant was we had undergraduates coming in and asking for help. Um, and I found myself uh, counseling a lot. So I was helping a lot of young people, um, helping them get into classes, helping them get into labs. And I would take them and say, oh, you know, you're, you're into biochem. Well, let me go introduce you to this one professor. Come on, let's go. And I'd grab his or her hand. And we'd walk down and knock on the professor's door and introduce them and try to get them in. So um, I, ended, I found myself helping a lot of students. And I really found this as my sweet spot. It kind of was like that the, those beginning, uh, the, those, that my encounters in high school of like seeing all this inequality and seeing all these people with opportunity was seeing these, uh, not, and seeing a, a community of people not having equal access to this opportunity and access to this opportunity. Um, so I found that these feelings in me of like, wow, this is great. I'm helping a lot of young people, mostly people of color, and a lot of women try to get access to these opportunities that weren't really open to them. Um, I really fell in love with it, and I really felt like I did a really good job. Um, the biology department hired me after to be a biology counselor, and so there I was again helping a lot of young people and helping um, mostly women and people of color like, kind of get access to this opportunity. So that um, kept leading to job after job offer, job offer, job offer. Um, I ended up getting offered from the Educational Partnership Center to run the MESA program. Are any of you familiar with the MESA program? Yeah, someone back there. Someone's listening back there. Um, so the MESA program, so I ran, it was like an outreach for the high schools in the sciences. So I ran all of their programs in Watsonville and Salinas and um, even Monterey. Um, so I was going out there, working in all the schools, and trying to get more students to pursue the sciences. Um, so I, did, I was doing all that work, um, and um, I did that for about a year. And then uh, the university, and this is all, I was a university employee. So this is the MESA program that they run out of here to get more students involved in the sciences. Um, so I was working for the university now for uh, about three years. I was running the MESA program. Um, I ran their first ever summer algebra academy for Watsonville, again as a UCSC employee, trying to uh, get more young people into, um, into getting access to university education, and, and algebra being a major gatekeeper. Um, so I was running this program. And then I received a, uh, a phone call from a woman named Jill Denner. Um, she actually got her graduate degree from UCSC as well. Um, uh, and Jill calls me up, and she says, uh, we just, uh, she works for a nonprofit up in Scotts Valley, and they just got a million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation. And this is in 2005. So technically, even when I was working here, I wasn't done with my education. I was always like kind of finishing up classes here and there. Um, she says, we got this million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation to run uh, a program for sixth grade girls in game design. Uh, so this is 2005, um, so still pretty early on in the, in the tech world. Um, and she says, we heard, you ran, we heard you ran this program out in Watsonville uh, doing this thing, the Summer Algebra Academy. Uh, would you be interested in a position running our program? Uh, so I left uh, UCSC and I took the job up at ETR, which is just right up the hill. Um, it stands for Education, Training, and Research. Um, and I started with a small team of them to um, do this work with girls in game design. Uh, so we were teaching girls coding. Uh, it was me, uh, Jill Denner, who was a uh, 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 kind of lead on the project, and this guy, Steve Bean. Um, and Steve will become, actually, Steve was my boss. Um, uh, and he'll come, he'll be relevant to this, my story later. Um, but so I started working for Steve and Jill um, and running tech programs for girls in Watsonville. We're teaching game design. We were, in fact, the first, I was the first group to ever take kids to Google on a field trip. Uh, so I took 60 uh, middle school girls to, sixth grade girls to Google when nobody ever took, now if you go to Google, there's a field trip there. Like everybody takes kids to Google. Um, 
But we were the first group to ever take kids, and the newspaper went with us, and it was a big old thing. Um, so I did that. Uh, so I started working for ETR. I was there with them for eight years. Um, and this whole time, uh, I, wasn't, I, I, I had my undergraduate, my BS in ecology and evolution. Um, I found my sit, myself in the space of um, a lot of academics, because uh, I was doing a lot of work for the National Science Foundation. Uh, it started off with those middle school girls, but then it expanded into boys, um, and it expanded to engaging parents. And it, by the time I left, we were in every school, elementary, middle, and high school in Watsonville, uh, doing computer science education um, for students. Um, and we were doing some work with parents as well. Um, but the whole time I was doing that work, I often was, found myself in DC in rooms with a bunch of academics, uh, a bunch of PhDs doing, you know, doing research, and always kind of feeling not, not adequate or not like I, I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, often was one of the few people of color in the room. Um, so a lot of the same feelings for me that I had kind of bubbling up when I was in high school reemerged in my professional career um, when I was doing all that work for the National Science Foundation. Um, so I went back and got my master's um, to kind of like, at least I could say I have a graduate degree. Um, and it's funny, they would always like introduce me as Dr. Martinez. And I never said it, I never questioned anything. I just let them sit, believe I was, had a doctorate. Because I would always just tell people, yeah, I got a graduate degree. Uh, but it was a master's. Um, but they would often call me as uh, Dr. Martinez. Um, even some publications I had, they had me listed as, a doctor, as having a PhD. Um, instructional technology, so how to use technology for instruction. Um, I got that degree at, uh, from Cal State Monterey Bay, and it was a complete online program. It was actually their first ever attempt at doing a 100% online program, so I was the first cohort um, in that program. Um, so I did that, uh, so I just found myself in the space and doing all this amazing work. Um, over the course of eight years, we brought in about $3 million into the community of Watsonville doing all this research and all this work. Um, and so kind of uh, really successful. Um, but it was uh, one evening, as, as you heard in my introduction, I was at uh, the farmer's market in Watsonville. It was a Friday. Uh, it was a, in October, so it was a chilly night, like the fog rolled in, like your typical uh, fall, winter on the Central Coast, or uh, your fall uh, in the Central Coast. Um, and it was a chilly night, and I was walking the farmer's market, and I saw a young woman uh, sitting outside of a building, typing away on a computer. And I could tell she was cold, because she had a very thin sweater, and it was a really chilly night. And being that I was in tech education, um, I went up to her, and I was like, hey, I'm Jacob, was, um, I'm involved in education. I'm just kind of curious, what, what are you sitting out here on a Friday night in the cold? And she's like, oh, I'm a college student. I'm, I'm studying at Cabrillo College. And um, I'm doing a research paper for one of my English courses. I said, yeah, but what are you doing sitting here? And, uh, and she said, uh, well, uh, I'm searching the internet for doing research. Um, I don't have internet at home. Um, I can't afford to go to Starbucks. Uh, the library was closed, um, so she was sitting outside this building tapping into the network. Right? And that just like floored me, because here's this brilliant young, young woman, tons of aspirations. I talked to her a little bit more, and she had dreams of go transferring, and um, you know, she was from a farm worker family, and her parents were farm workers. But here, hitting, like, here she was, like hitting this barrier right, of access right? um, and opportunity. Kind of like all those things that like reminded me of a lot of students that I worked with here, like just brilliant young people, but hitting these barriers right, and of access. Um, so I went home that night and told my wife the story, and I was swearing and saying words like, "What am I doing all this work? I've been doing all this work for years and years, and nothing's changed. Like there's still these young people without access to basic uh, internet." Um, I was like, "I'm done. I got to like switch careers. I got to do something different." Um, and then uh, two weeks later, I was having coffee with a friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Neuner, who was the founder of Next Space, which is in downtown Santa Cruz. It's a co-working space. And I was telling him this story. And I was like, Jeremy, there should be a co-working space for young people. And I was like, because here's this young person, just tons of aspirations, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the coffee, he's like, Jacob, you should do it. You should totally do it. Um, 
and uh, he's like, and the per you should talk to this person named Bud Colligan, because he would really love this idea. Um, so I'll pause there, because that's when the story of the digital nest kind of takes off. Um, but I don't know if there's any questions up to this point about kind of my path to get me to that date. If not, I'll just keep flowing. Yeah? Okay, so this is now 2013. Uh, so this is when I had this conversation with Jeremy. Um, this guy, Bud Colligan, he's a venture capitalist. He lives in Santa Cruz. Um, he was the f uh, CEO of Macromedia. Macromedia were the creators of Flash and Dreamweaver. Um, so he was the CEO of Macromedia when Adobe bought them out. So he created, he did that merger of, or that, that acquire from Macromedia to um, Adobe. So he was, so I knew this, I, I knew of him. I had met him once before. So I knew he was really a uh, wealthy individual. Um, and so in October of 2013, I went and had breakfast with him. And I told him I had this, like, what if we did a next space for young people where we could have a space for young people to come in, get access to the tools, and, and, but beyond just access to the internet and a safe space, if we um, provided training and education to make them competitive and, um, and then help them network. And uh, so um, he's like, oh, Jacob, I love this idea. I love this idea. Get me a business plan. And I've never written a business plan in my life. Like, I was this biologist and then, like, counselor, right? And he's, I'm like, but it's, I want to do a nonprofit. Do I, you don't need a business plan for nonprofits. He's like, get me a business plan. Um, so that night, I went home, and my wife and I downloaded a template from Google, and uh, we op uploaded it to Google Docs, and I was writing it, and she was editing it. I was going, and uh, we, we put together a business plan. Um, at, the day after Christmas, I emailed it to him. And uh, in January, we had another meeting in Watsonville. And the first thing he says was, this is one of the worst business plans I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. There's typos all over the place and just all these mistakes. Um, but he said, but every question I had, you had a piece of it in your business plan. So he's like, I know you were thinking like along the right lines. You know? um, and so we were, we were having lunch in Watsonville. We were looking, and he's like, let's go for walks. So we're walking around downtown Watsonville. And, uh, if you've ever been in downtown Watsonville, it's changing now, but uh, back in, 2013, in 2013, 2014, it was it's pretty dead, and there wasn't much activity going on. It's starting to change. Um, but we were looking in windows and trying to like, imagine spaces. And he's like, all right, uh, this, uh, this is January 2014. And he's like, uh, let me go home and talk to my wife, and I'll give you a call tomorrow, and I'll tell you what we think. Um, and so I waited around, and I got the phone call, and he's like, hey, and I knew he was really well off. I meant, remind you that I had a full-time position at ETR. I was a director. I was pretty good career trajectory. So um, I thought he'd kind of give a donation, five, ten thousand, 5, 10,000, and I'd be fundraising for this thing for the next few years and be 2016, 2017 by the time I opened this thing up. Um, he said, Jacob, my wife and I love this idea. Uh, we'll give you $100,000 to start this thing. He said, but you got to raise 200000 in three months. So he was testing me, right? Um, so I hung up the phone. It was a Friday. I went in that Monday, talked to my boss. It's like, hey, I think I'm, I want you to know about this thing I'm doing. So it's like, you know I'm not working on company time. Like, this is uh, completely separate. Um, and so that was the, the beginning of, of this crazy digital nest like ramp that I've had, or it just kind of took off on me. Um, so uh, that was January 2014, kind of went public uh, with this thing in February 2014. Um, this is where I asked all my friends and family and acquaintances that I've ever encountered. I wrote letters to and asked them for money I needed raised $200,000 and, um, and so I could get this, uh, this donor's match. And um, we raised about 300000 in just about that much time. Um, so in November of 2014, we opened the doors to the Digital Nest. Um, and so what's the Digital Nest? So um, what I did is, uh, remember I talked about those field trips to Google that we went on? 
Um, so I used to take middle schoolers and high schoolers to Google and Facebook and Apple. I've been I've taken them everywhere. And every time we, re, we took a bus from Watsonville over to those campuses, when we were there, they just loved it, right? The free food and people in pajamas and all the cool lighting and tech and the, the, whatever you can imagine there. And all the employees were like, this is the best place ever to work. And, you know, this is my dream job. And I come in whenever I want. And I leave whenever I want. And if I needed an, an adapter for my Mac, I just submit a request. And here it is, you know, just like, like magic, you know? Um, and so for years, I've been taking these kids to these places, right? And so all these kids were always, like, so thrilled. And I thought to myself, if, if these environments are working for adults, right, and adults are just trying to get jobs in these companies, like, I've, I almost, like, left my job a few times just to get those perks. Um, why aren't we doing this, doing this in our educational settings? Why aren't we creating our, our computer labs and our computer spaces in the same way that these tech companies are doing? Um, so what we have in Digital Nest now, if you come to Digital Nest in Watsonville, uh, you walk in and there's neon lights and there's desks and there's co-working space and we've got a recording studio and we've got a room where you get all the tech that you want. We have 150 machines uh, all loaded with the Adobe Creative Suite, um, every iPad, everything you can imagine. Um, we have a chef that cooks meals on a weekly basis. Uh, every Wednesday, the chef's there and cooking fresh meals. Uh, you could get, every, any day of the week, you could come in and get salmon, tikka masala. You could get, uh, like, it's all frozen and, like, all organic, locally grown food. Um, we have, uh, so it's that we've, we've taken that model with Tech Campus and apply it to youth tech spaces. And this is completely free for anyone from high school to 24 years of age. So if you're a 24-year-old, you could get access to all this. Um, completely free. Um, so we, have, we eliminate that barrier of access, right? So everybody has access to, um, to safe space and the tools and the technology. Um, we have the third fastest internet in the community of Watsonville. Um, it's a really fast internet. Uh, Cruise, Cruise.io is a partner with us on that. Um, it seems falling off. No. Um, and then, um, uh, so that's the basis of, like, the base of the foundation of what we do. Um, then we layer on training and education, not so they can compete for jobs, but so they can out-compete for jobs. So we have three different career tracks. So we have digital arts and technology. It's all the graphic design, uh, videography, photography, music production. Um, and we have professors from, um, we actually have a partnership with UCSC on a podcasting workshop, or podcasting classes. Um, our second career paths, web and IT. So it's all the coding, web design, data management. And the last one is we call people. Um, and it's around project management and leadership. And so we do teach project management, marketing, communications. Um, so we have different career paths that members can take. Um, and then the top level is what we have, we call business. Then we hire our top students. And they actually work for us. And then we do work for clients. And so some of our clients, they do work for clients. So some of the work that we do, we've done work for American Express, for Facebook, um, Martinelli's. Uh, we built a website for UC Santa Cruz. Um, we've done work for Driscoll's, uh, pretty much a lot of local companies. Um, in fact, three of our current, we call them business members, are UC, current UCSC students. Um, so we get a lot of UCSC students as well. Um, so we do, uh, so we tr we're training them up. Right? So we, we give a foundation of access and then education, and then we do the social networking and social capital piece of it. Because a lot of our students uh, are told, you do well in high school, so you could go to college. Right? So all of you have did that. Now you're told, do well in college, so you could get a job. Right? But what happens for many students that are graduating college, they graduate from UCSC or any other university, they go to home to where they're from, and all of a sudden, they have no more social capital because their parents don't, aren't networked in. You don't know anybody, you know anybody. You've been gone for four or five years now, but you have this expectation now of you to go home and make money and help your family out or, or be independent and do well. But nobody teaches you like, how to do that as well as build that network. Um, so that, the word, that, that social capital 
and the networking piece of the digital nest, where it was all kind of from in my story was all rooted in that first knock on that door of that shed behind um, the science building. Right? It was this idea that if I, and I did this kind of unintentionally, this idea of like knocking on a door, asking for help, being networked in, and building a network, and then giving that net, giving access of my network to other people. When I was a, when I was doing the biology advising, that's what I was doing, not knowing that's what I was doing. Um, and then the same thing for now, what we do at Digital Nest. So we give access to our network to members of the Digital Nest. Um, so we have 2,200 members of the Digital Nest, uh, and we have two sites. And so we're in Watsonville, and we're in Salinas, um, and we just uh, landed a, a partnership with the foundation to open 16 more locations across the country. Um, so think of us as like a 21st century boys and girls club, right? So this idea around the space to go, um, but really targeted at workforce development. So getting young people, young professionals, um, that network and the skills so they could outcompete people for jobs and opportunities. Um, so um, that's kind of where we're at today. It's been, um, we're celebrating five years this November uh, and we've grown tremendously. Um, we've, our, we've doubled every year our budget. Um, we're, we're, we're higher like crazy. Um, half, just about half of my employees are UCSC alumni. Um, and four or three of them are from the Everett program. Um, so if you know the Everett program here, I think it's one of the best programs I've ever seen in any college. Um, and that's through, I think, the sociology department. Um, and they're teaching social justice uh, through, um, and using technology as a tool to, to address inequalities. Um, so I think they do a fabulous job uh, training young people, so I do a lot of hiring from that program. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll pause there and uh, answer any questions about the gym. Yeah? So it struck me earlier on you talked about the difference in confidence um, from the group that you were with in high school in LA and and I'm wondering um, how that relates to some of the work that you're doing with digital, digital nest to help build up that confidence. Yeah, so that's a big piece of the work that we do. Um, and it's something that you, no one gets taught, right? Like um, in high school, it's all college prep, right? But college prep is not career prep, right? And uh, um, but we think the opposite with the digital nest. We think career prep is both college prep because the skills that you're gaining to be successful in a career actually prepare you to be successful in college, like time management, task management, collaboration, communication. So we teach all those fundamental skills um, to get people to be successful in college, but also sets them up to be successful in careers. Um, but that confidence piece, I think, comes with all that, you know? Um, we work with majority, f uh, we're, we're ma majority of our members are Watsonville and Salinas. So those are predominantly farm worker communities, so f children are farm workers. Um, but we see that lack of confidence, um, even in university students, um, uh, even UCSC students. So um, we do a lot of work around that. It's a big central part of what we do. Um, so every one of our member, as a member, you kind of go through, um, we have other youth there that have been in the program for longer kind of welcome all the new ones in and help kind of help them learn to be uh, successful in the environment. Um, because if you come to the Digital Nest and you walk through our doors, um, there'll be 40, 50 people in the building. Um, nobody's messing around. There's not YouTube going on. There's not gaming going on. And you would think there would be because it's like we have really fast internet and all this, all this tech, but people are working. And it's pretty remarkable. Um, so the culture is really interesting. And so even from the be beginning as you walk in, it's really intimidating to a lot of people who have never been there before because all of our youth have really high confidence now. Um, so we do a lot of work around that. Um, and it's, uh, it's about network. It's about, it's about having young people see the worth that they have in themselves. Um, 
and seeing the t- and helping them identify the tools and that they have, um, because uh, oftentimes they just don't know that they have the skills that uh, make them actually competitive or even more competitive than other peers from more affluent communities. Um, I tell people, I do a lot of talks, and I always say I'll put my, any Digital Nest member up to any kid from an affluent community any day in terms of their grit, in terms of their, their confidence now, in terms of their, their creativity, um, and, and all those other assets. I mean, for, uh, you hear a lot of people talk about entrepreneurship, um, especially a lot of people in tech, talk about this idea of entrepreneurship and this idea of like chasing your dreams and just, just go for it and just drop out of school and like, chase your dream or build that app. But a lot of, oftentimes those people have a lot of, have a safety net underneath them. Um, but when we talk to our youth, it's like who come from low income households and we say, look, your parent that's been selling tamales out of the back of their car or babysitting their, their nieces and nephews to make extra money or doing, working two jobs, like all for, like, to improve your life and improve their own life. That's the true meaning of entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is about taking risks to advance yourself in your career or, or, your, like, or your economic opportunities. So people with the safety net below them are not, and they, them calling themselves entrepreneurs, that's not the true meaning of entrepreneurship because they're not taking that big of a risk. Right? And so I think for a lot of the, the confidence building that we're doing with young people, it's about just con- connecting the dots for them and sh- sh- like shedding those lights on, on those, and like dismantling those, mis- those perceptions about what, uh, entrepreneurship and about you know, how prepared they are. And so. Any other questions? Did your parents... Uh, expect you to, to go to college and, and succeed? I mean, was there a lot of pressure from all of us there? Um, not so much. So um, my dad actually went to college um, because he was drafted during Vietnam. So he, the, my dad also, he was a, like naturally, my dad was an immigrant. Um, he came over when he was three. Um, it's funny he got drafted even though he wasn't a U.S. citizen so, um, because he had a green card. So they could draft you. During Vietnam, there was, they allowed you to get drafted and they promised you citizenship after you served. So um, my dad got drafted during Vietnam. Um, he actually tested really high on his, on his scores. So he, um, he went to the service, came out of it, and took advantage of the GI Bill and got his college paid for, his, his college paid for. So he went to Cal State LA. Um, so my dad was actually unique in that he was a Mexican immigrant, got a citizenship and got a college education out of it. Um, and so we kind of, but he never really taught us how to navigate the college um, pathway. Um, but I had uh, two older sisters that went to college, uh, one uh, to UC Santa Barbara and my other one to UC Santa Cruz. And that's why, that's why I chose UC Santa Cruz. Um, but uh, he didn't really put, he didn't really put pressure on me to be successful. Uh, when, I, when I failed in high school and barely graduated, he kind of like expected that that was it, you know? So he, I, and then when I went to college on a soccer scholarship and I failed out of that, and when then I ran away, he kind of uh, just kind of brushed me off. So um, I never had a lot of pressure. Um, I think he thought I'd do well because he knew I was a hard worker. But uh, I, I didn't think he, I know for a fact, he never thought this would happen to me. You know? This is, I've been really fortunate. Um, uh, I've spoken at the White House under the previous administration. Um, I'm going to be invited back currently. Um, but uh, I just have I've always been, have had really, like, people say luck, but it was a combination of luck and being in the right place and, like, and doing good work and people believing in me. And I've always had luck because of those things. 
so speaking at the White House, um, uh, meeting the Chief Technology o Officer of the United States because of, I was at the White House, um, Facebook seeing that I was, gave a talk at the White House and they, they did an event to promote my work and that kind of went viral and the whole digital mess thing went viral. Um, I've met a lot of really interesting people. Uh, Guy Kawasaki, uh, who's one of the chief evangelists. Um, he's one of only two people who gets paid to drive a Mercedes Benz. Um, he wrote a book called Why, he's, he's written like 15 books. Um, we do videos, we do all his video work for him now. Uh, he's a Santa Cruz guy. Um, but anyways, we just, we have been fortunate and met a lot of people. Yeah. Other questions? So I have a question for the students here. Do you feel like you have support on campus to get the kind of skills that the Digital Nest is teaching? Is it available for you? Networking? You know, things like that. I think you have to do a lot of it yourself. Yeah. Um, there's a really, like an organization or something to help you like network. Like you have to reach out to the like, and yeah. the and stuff. And the career center in five people will just tell you, like, oh, you have to email them the office hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm, you know, a librarian, and we're not known for being, you know really dynamic negotiators. <laughs> so when I was in graduate school, just on the off chance that you were available on a particular evening, the dean did this salary negotiation workshop. Mm -hmm. You know, and it really changed my life. He was like, whoa, I could ask for more, you know, because that's not my temperament. You know, it's not the librarian way. Yeah. It's expect less, you know. <laughs> And so it's, you know, I always think about that one chance really changed my career trajectory. So how can we help students here? I think you're going to go ahead. Uh, I would say that it depends what you're struggling with. Uh -huh. So if you're like a first generation college student and you're struggling with choosing your family college classes or maybe you messed up in the first quarter, yeah. that can really impact you because you yeah. didn't know how to use them. Advisor yet, mm -hmm. um, but if you're like a more common issue and people are already expecting that you have that issue, yeah. um, it's like the only time they say having starting text might be beneficial, yeah. and, um, and that's when I think that there are resources on campus that can help you. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bit of a less known issue, one that's not super hyped up by the media or is not downplayed. It can be really challenging to get the accurate resources, even though people are trying to help you and there's an effort to try to help. Mm -hmm. Getting the resources that will actually help is very hard to find. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, I'm also uh, on the UCSC Alumni Council, so. Um, and I'm the chair of the Local Affairs Committee, so that means I'm kind of working with the university on local issues. Um, and I, th I think the, the university's been struggling for, since its existence, of how, what's the social capital of being a UCSC alumni, right? When, when so many other universities, and you all have friends and, and that went off to other universities and have like this luxury of prestige or athletics or things to kind of rally people around, right? And I think the university for years has been trying to figure out like, what is it for UCSC? And how do we rally people around this idea that being from UCSC is special and, and giving you all social capital so that when you go for apply for a job, you can find an alumni there that works at that company and get access to that, that person to open the door for you, right? And, this university has been horrible at it. Horrible, horrible, horrible at it, right? And now you all are students, and now you're about, some of you may be about to graduate, and like, like how do I go knock on that door if it's never, you know? So I think the university has been struggling with that, right? And now, and I think what, what um, I think this university does have 
is a lot of people doing social work or have created social change. Um, and I think the university needs to do a better job propping those people up because we're never going to rally around athletics, right? We just, we never will, right? We're all not coming back for the game. You're not going to bring your, you're not 10 years from now, you're not going to come back in town for the game, right? Like it ain't happening, right? Um, and, and, and we don't have that Ivy League or like that prestige that comes with this university, right? But what I think this university does have is a lot of, a lot of humble people that have done amazing things and have really created social change. And it's like, how do we elevate those people? Um, and then um, in order to start building some social capital for, for you all, right? Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's something that as an alumni, like when you become an alumni, you really be active about and trying to do that for and like stay connected to this campus and other undergraduates are coming through. Um, like I'm here tonight, right? Like I, I came up uh, at, with this invitation because I, I think it's important that alumni uh, make themselves like, accessible to other uh, current students, right? Um, so networking, 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 I've been talking about it from the very beginning, but that's really been the key to my success. Uh, I'm a really good networker. Uh, it's something that I'm not comfortable in, but I've had to grow my comfort in. I found myself in rooms where I wasn't comfortable. Um, uh, I've been in room, big rooms where I was the only person of color uh, or only person without a graduate degree, right? And you kind of have to like struggle through that and get through it. Um, and uh, so I think as, as you're here as a student, like figure out how to go do that, like how to go knock on that professor's door and hold them accountable to that, you know, like their office hours. And you, you said you're here to, like, for me as a student, and you're inviting me in, like, here I am, you know, and hopefully they respond. But um, how do you start linking or connecting the alumni that can help you open doors for you, you know? Um, this campus has not done a good job with that, and I think, uh, I think there's some of us, I think there's a lot of people that want to change that, a lot of current staff. and and alumni and students that want to see that change. And the Career Center is doing some good stuff now. And um, so like reach out to them. Um, but I think it's you as, as undergraduates or grad students need to hold professors and hold staff and hold the university accountable to providing that network for you. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any advice for students who are interested in starting that process of networking but just not sure where to start? Yeah, so um, I think I actually took some notes too. But um, uh, networking at events is always, going to events is always the best way to start your networking. But those are intimidating too, because it's always like, could be 50, 25, 50, 100 people in the room, you don't know any of them. But there's always somebody else that doesn't know anybody. So you always go find the person that's standing by themselves as well, right? And so that's where, because they're probably just as uncomfortable. And so finding that person in the room that's by themselves and going straight for them. And that's the person you want to connect with because they're just as uncomfortable. And like that's, it's, you know, so they don't know anybody either. So trying to find those people um, in the room that don't have uh, that connection. Um, and I think having your, you, you got to be able, like know how to introduce yourself and practice that. So you're comfortable with how to introduce yourself. Um, but events have been the best way. Asking others. If someone gives you their business card, um, that's an open invitation for you to email them or connect with them. Uh, so I always do. If someone gives me the business card, I shoot them off an email the next day and say, hey, it was nice meeting you at the library yesterday. Like, I would love to stay connected. You know, I'm going to search you on LinkedIn. I want to try to connect with you. Like, um, those basic things. I, I use my LinkedIn a lot. So if I'm trying to get access to somebody at a company, I'll search my LinkedIn, see if I know anybody that knows anybody there, and I'll ask them to make an introduction. Um, so LinkedIn, like a social network, is kind of like, who uses LinkedIn? But um, actually, it's like for, for professionally, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good tool to have. Um, so um, yeah, so use LinkedIn. Um, 
the other thing, I got a question and before this that was submitted about uh, resumes and getting jobs. Like how do, um, and do you have any pointers for if you're submitting a resume or interviewing for a job? One of the most common things that happens in resumes is that people are talking about their skills um, and what, who, what they've accomplished. But as an employer, I could care less about how great this job will be for you and what skills you have. I want to know really how are you going to make my life better and how are you going to make my life easier as an employer. If you're going to work for me, like I'm hiring because I got some work that I can't do or I need extra help. And so how are you the right person to solve my problem? Right? So when you're reading through job descript like job postings, you could pretty easily pick up on what exactly the work is they want you to do and where their pain point is. So when you're selling yourself through a cover letter or through a resume, talk about how your skills and your strengths help, will help you solve their problem. Make it about the company or the, or the, person, or the individual the hiring manager um, and about what the pain that they're feeling. Because if they didn't, then they wouldn't be hiring. Right? None of us hire for just the sake of, like, we're, we have budgets and we're struggling to make money, and we're struggling to, you know, um, so we do hires only in the absolute necessity that we need something done for us because there's a pain there, right? So when you're applying for jobs or, or, uh, or interviewing, it's about the employer, um, about the employer. And another question I got was about like the job interview, like, like what, do you have any recommendations for questions to ask? I got the best question that will guarantee you look really favorably at the end of your interview. And because at, at the end of each interview, what's the last question that any interviewer has for the interviewee? Yeah, who said that? Yeah, do you have any questions for me? Right? So, and what do what most people say? Oh, when's, when are you gonna make a decision? You know, what's the salary? You know, no, I'm good, I got everything. Uh, Right? That's always what they ask. What you should ask is, why should I choose to work here? Or what, why do you choose to work here? Because what you want to do is, when you're basically throwing that question, like, like, hey, Elizabeth, so why do you choose to come and work at the library every day? Because that, what that does two things. One, it instantly shows that this is your choice as well. And it is your choice to come work for this company but it also gets that person talking about themselves and all the positive, that, oh, I love coming here, the people are great, it's a cool environment, my, my boss is super flexible, blah, 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 blah. And so when they, when they finish up that question, they're leaving and they're feeling good about themselves and they just got done talking about themselves and they're like, wow, I really like that, that person was great. <laughs> you know, they, like, cause they feel good, right? I guarantee you, if you ask that question at any of your interviews, that that interview will go well. It always freaking works. I, I kid you not. I've had so many people come back to me like, oh my God, that last question was great, great, you know? Um, so that's, that's key, yeah. How did you figure that out? Or like, did you just try and error? My oh, wife. Oh. Yeah, my wife, we were like, I was interviewing for that job at ETR. And I knew I was getting an interview and we were trying to bring so many questions. And she's like, you know what you should do? You know? Most of my good advice I ever received from my wife. Um, and I, I'm a good listener, too. Uh, so I, we thought of it. And sure enough, like, we've been telling it to other people. And it freaking works. It works so well. And it totally makes sense, right? It's like when it's telling, like, it's making it clear that you're making a choice. And then, too, it makes people talk about themselves. And people like to talk about themselves. Good yeah. question. And yeah. I But I'm curious um, uh, for, I, I think a lot about students that are, I mean, even when I was a student, um, undergraduate, and there's, there are certain sort of characteristics that you have when you start school, and you know, you sort of, as you pass through education, by the end, you're a different person. But one thing that I've noticed about students, and even about myself at that period, is the incessant talking. <laughs> that, like the way we present ourselves, we said talking. And I wonder if you've noticed um, in your work, um, like, where is there a point where people of that age start to listen and ask questions of 
like become curious about other people, not just about that you know, like, I need to tell my, because I, I find this especially with students of color, that they're like, I need to tell my story, and my story is really important to me, and that's what they, you know, I did it too, that's just, that's what we pass off as ourselves. But I realize that the more I listen, and, and I actually, just similar to what you just said about um, you know, flipping the question, flipping the question to ask them about stuff that is not true. Yeah. Is there like a kind of like a, a way that you see that someone developing? No, and I think it's, I mean, I think, so I did learn, I, I still remember a few things from biology. Most of it I forgot. I can't tell you how cells made up anymore or anything, but um, like w humans are social animals, all right? And so I think we're craving like social in interactions and conversation. And I think the rise of technology has done the complete opposite, um, even though and we were talking about this earlier, I think the social networks, um, they're not really social. And there's all this research around, around I, mean, I mean, horrific research around like suicide rates and like people who are on more social networks for a longer time, like their suicide rates like, go up and there's all these like negative things, right? I think we're, we're, we're social animals, but I think we've been conditioned in this time to like talk, 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 get, get things out there and, you know, be visible and be seen and be, you know, and the pressure of like not being left out and like looking at your parents and all that. I think it's, I think it's really challenging. Um, um, and so, it, I mean, back to the nest, you, you come in and it's everything social. Like there's, you won't find a desk by someone by himself on a desk, like trying to create environments where people naturally have conversation. Um, but I don't know, that's a, that's a tough, I don't know that answer, you know? Um, I know for me it was um, kind of like an kind of evolving process and, and uh, like learning how to listen and being really thoughtful and um, learning how to listen, you know? Uh, it's, 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 it's a skill and it's one of the skills that doesn't get taught. Um, there was a, there was a, a person, Monica Sharma, uh, who is from India. She was the head of um, the United Nations, like the, there's like the human, humanitarian side of it. She wrote this book and she does this training here. She did it in Santa Cruz a while ago, a, a, a transformational leadership. And, and it's, it's so much of it, it was around the power of, of listening. Um, and like we went through exercises on like how to listen, and, you know, and how to like, stop and um, not think about what your, rea your response to someone's, I think that's what happens to a lot of us, is like you start talking with somebody and you usually start thinking about how you're gonna respond to that person without fully listening. So I don't know, I think, I think people need to be intentional about it. I think it needs to be taught. It's not being taught. So many of these skills are not being taught. And I, I see higher education now starting to catch up and realize like we're not preparing young pe people for work um, so I think it's going to slowly change, but, um, and you're seeing it like in libraries actually with community spaces and, um, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Your first part was, what do you advise for entrepreneurs? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I guess I'm a social entrepreneur. That's how people label me. Um, uh, and the executive director. And um, what that really means is I'm a salesman. Uh, I never knew I'd grow up to be a salesman. You know? Like, that would be the last thing I, but, but really, as a leader, as an executive director, as an entrepreneur, you really become a salesperson. Um, so um, I think my best advice for entrepreneurs is not to start off being an entrepreneur, is go to work and, and, and see how systems work, uh, see how processes work, understand infrastructure. So learn as much as you can in those environments. So much of what I'm doing at Digital Nest, I learned through what I saw at ETR. Um, I, uh, uh, so I think, I think those are like, it's really important to actually go to work and 
can absorb things. Um, surround yourself with smarter people. Uh, I mentioned Steve Bean my, uh, earlier in my talk. He was my former boss. Um, uh, I hired him. He's not my boss. I'm not his boss. You know? and, so, and he's way smarter than me. He's like really one of the smartest people. Another UCSC alum, uh, one of the smartest people I've ever met. And when I, so when I launched Digital Nest, I wanted to surround myself with smarter people. And so many, you hear that advice a lot as entrepreneurs, like people are like, oh, get people smarter than you. And, um, and it's not easy. You know, it's like takes a lot of like, there's sometimes I'm like, man, like going home, like he should be running the company, you know, or, you know, but, um, but then you have to stop and be like, well, wait a second, I've made that choice for the company to hire this really smart person. And there's a lot of power in that. Um, so I think as an entrepreneur, it's, it's going to work, working for some years, and, and like really understanding business. If I, could have gone back, if I could have gone back, I probably would have been a business major. If, like now that I know I'm an entrepreneur, should I run this big organization? Like learning how to run a business, you're running a business. You know, at the end of the day, I need to generate revenue. I have expenses. I have you know, financial statements. I have cash versus actual, budget versus actuals. Like all these like business terms I've learned along the way. I think I could have learned in business school. would have been really helpful. Um, but work, if you can, think, consider business, um, and then surrounding yourself with really smart people. Uh, networking, I can't tell you how much networking, how important it is, and some people, it's, it's really hard, challenging to network, and you know, people are really introverts. Um, and my daughter's an introvert, and so I have, I have a lot of respect, and I see the power in introverts, so um, I think being okay with being an introvert and learning how networking works for you. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a good talk on YouTube about introverts. Um, so if you're an introvert, there's a lot of power in that. And um, they, they tend to be more thoughtful and have better outcomes because they take time to think rather than just react. Um, so I think uh, figuring out how to network for you um, and taking advantage of opportunities that come your way. I've, I've had a lot of jobs in my life. I've worked at gas stations. I've worked at pharmacies. I've worked at a nursery with plants. I've worked at the university. I've had a lot of jobs in my life, and I've always worked really hard. Um, I never was in any of those things for money. It was always just like the experience and just worked and worked and worked. And now I make pretty decent money because of that. And so I think don't chase the money. Um, you know. Did I answer your question? I don't, was there more specifics? Or? Yeah, yeah. But being, a, being an entrepreneur is not easy. You know, if, if, if you're interested in being an entrepreneur, um, it's, it's, you're, you're taking risks without that safety net. That's what true entrepreneurship is, you know? So it's not easy. There's been months where my cash in my org company was like way low and I was like, like if we don't get this in, like a donation in or a grant in, like we're gonna have to furlough people and there's a lot of ups and downs, you know? Um, so if you're interested in startups, like, you actually live in a really good environment, Santa Cruz. There's a lot of startups, so you can actually go see what a startup looks like and how to run a startup. Um, you know. What the questions? Yeah. Um, so when you were establishing Digital Nest, uh, what were some challenges that you faced? And specifically, like, did you find it difficult to kind of get the word out that like there is this place that exists that like we could, like, help you yeah, um, uh, we were actually pretty lucky, and like I've never really done any marketing. Uh, we've we've we went pretty, I guess you would call it like viral pretty quickly, um, and a lot of that was because of all the years of work I was doing before. Um, so all, like when I launched the Digital Nest, people knew what I was talking about uh, because I had all this research behind me. So um, and. Uh, and so words kind of got out pretty quickly. Um, but some of my earliest challenges were when I first started, I created a board. You have to create a board of directors. I, hired, I, I recruited a lot of my friends and, and other social activists and community organizers. And then you sit around a table with a bunch of social activists and community organizers, and you realize none of you like financials. None of you know how to raise money, so like you had to diversify people, and that was another. Th that was one of the other things I learned in, that I remember from biology, from ecology, was the best in, 
the richest environments are the most diverse environments, right? And it's, it's true even in business. And you hear that thrown out a lot around too, like, oh, diverse teams are important for business. And it's actually really true. Um, and I could, I mean, it worked like, and my board was an example of that, was I didn't have much diversity in terms of skill sets on my board. And we quickly realized that that wasn't going to work. So we had to go get a lawyer on our board. We had to get an accountant on our board. We had to get a, somebody who knew real estate on our board. Somebody like we had to diversify our board. Um, and then there was, and, and that's that belief and is carried through even through all the people we hire. Um, so when we, when we make, we're hiring three people this upcoming year. Um, and when we look at kind of, it's not, we don't, we also don't look just for um, what, what's the position that we're looking for, but what are all the other skill sets that we're missing in the makeup of our staff? So if, um, if we're looking, uh, so then we try to identify people uh, in the hiring pool that also have other skills that, like I'm trying to hire a finance person, but there's other skills that we're looking for other than finance that would make that person a good member of the team. Um, so I think uh, early on that, that challenge of um, just trying to hire people like me um, didn't work. Uh, raising money is always crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy in nonprofits. It's crazy in, uh, if, in business. And just because you're a nonprofit, it doesn't make it easier. It's just as hard. Uh, to raise money and to sell, you know. Um, you, the other thing, a lot of like people often come to me, ask me how to start a nonprofit, and a lot of the advice I give is for them to first think about: Are, are you trying to? Do you want to run an organization or do you want to run a program? Because if your idea is a program, then find a nonprofit to embed that program in. Um, or if it's that big of an idea, uh, and if you want to run an organization. Um, then it's a nonprofit. Because I do almost zero with programming now. Um, I don't design programs. I don't teach youth. I don't counsel youth. Um, I have an open door policy. They can always come in and talk to me. But most of my work is on the business side of, of running an organization. So, so I think if you're interested in social entrepreneurship, uh, and asking yourself those questions too of you know, what is it that you really want to do. The other thing, um, especially in the nonprofit world, is they have a, a tendency to not pay people well because you're taking one for the team or you're doing it for the cause, right? Like, but I don't, I don't believe that. And so we're trying to pay people really well. Um, and so I think if you're interested in nonprofit work or social entrepreneurship, like you think you could, you could challenge some of the stereotypes of nonprofit work and it's, it's okay, yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for joining in, everybody. Yeah, I think I got business cards, all right? <laughs> so if you want a business card, I also got stickers. Uh, this is actually Guy Kawasaki. Does anybody know Guy Kawasaki? Yeah, so he's, um, if you look him up, he's really famous in the tech world. But he actually brought me on stage at an event, and he said, uh, Digital Nest builds bridges, not walls. So we have a sticker on that. And then uh, we have a Femi Nest. So is that a feminist, but Femi Nest sticker. So um, if you want stickers, I got business cards. You're totally welcome to any of this stuff. And then, like I said, if I've, someone gives you a business card, I'm opening up an opportunity for you to net, reach out to me. Um, oh, and last, last thing I should tell you. Um, we run a conference called Nest Flight. It's October 12th. It's for college students. Um, UCSC is one of the schools that we recruit from. So if you check out nestflight.org, um, you are going to be with 300, 300 college students from UCSC, CSUMB, Hartnell, Cabrillo, um, Monterey Peninsula College, and a few from Santa Clara. Uh, it's a one-day conference for you to come and get access to amazing speakers. I have an animator from Pixar who did all the animation for the movie Up, who was lead animator for Up. Um, Guy Kawasaki is a keynote. I have the founder of Multicultural Marketing for Google, this woman, Eliana Murillo. She's going to be a keynote. Uh, LinkedIn's going to come and work, do a workshop. Looker's doing a workshop. GitHub's doing a workshop. They're all major sponsors. So I bring Silicon Valley to us. 
as well as all the local companies, so uh, like Looker, Plantronics, well, it's called, not called Poly, but Plantronics, um, Driscoll's, Taylor Farms, all the big employers locally all come. And so they want to meet college students. And so they want to recruit you for both internships and jobs. Um, it's the second year we're doing this. Uh, this is eventually will be the biggest conference in the state for college students to get access to jobs and internships. So you can have a chance to be a part of it while still kind of getting off the ground. Uh, it's by application only. Um, so just check out nestflight.org and you can find out more information about that. Cool? Awesome. Thank you.